Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Christian Democracy, where we talk about Catholic social teaching in the light of contemporary affairs. My name is Jack Quirk. We begin with a prayer. Father, let us be the hands that bring food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, healing to the sick, comfort to the prisoners, and welcome to the strangers. May everything that is said here be in furtherance of these things and of your truth and of your love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And as as I said, the name of this show is Christian Democracy here on WCAT Internet Radio, and this is our inaugural program. And... uh, because it's the inaugural program and we needed to do something really uh, really intention engaging to uh, bring your attention to what we're trying to do here. Uh, our guest this evening is Mark Shea. And Mark Shea, if you pay attention to Catholic media at all, he needs no introduction. He currently blogs at uh, he has uh, at Patheos Catholic, and he is an author of a number of books. Uh, the most recent that I know of are Salt and Like, The Commandments, The Beatitudes, and A Joyful Life, The Heart of Catholic Prayer, Rediscovering Our Father and the Hail Mary, and uh, The Church and the New Media, Blogging Converts. And of course, as I mentioned, he also blogs at Patheos, and he's been through the media. And all over the place, all kinds of Catholic media. And I didn't know this about you, Mark, but apparently you're a, a performance artist as well. You were on EWTN uh, in something called G.K. Chesterton, the Apostle of Common Sense. Yeah, uh, uh, was and uh, was in it. I was in a <laughs> an unreleased film. Was, maybe someday we'll see it. Who knows? Oh, there was there was, uh, was, was that of, Man Alive. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was Man Alive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, so I got to I'm, play Innocent Smith. That was fun. I would, yeah, I was research, researching you there, and I was just amazed at what a Renaissance man you you turned out to be. You know, how, well, and on, t- <laughs> and on top of and on top of that, you are a uh, a four time grandfather, and that's got to be your highest calling. So, you know, if you want to talk about uh, talk about those uh, sources well, of I've, pride, I got some. I got some adorable grandkids. That is that is for sure. Um, I have an eight year old. Uh, granddaughter named Lucy and a four-year-old named Seraphim, who is just a pistol. Seraphim is a go at concern and her younger sister is Charlotte and her younger brother is uh, Zeno, who was, he just got hatched about a month ago. Ah, okay. So, uh, she, yeah, so uh, we're, we're, we're having a good time and, and the kids uh, live in the area so we get to see the grandkids. We, in fact, we, we had them, um, we, we w- got invited over for a brunch on um, Sunday for, for Father's Day. So we set up the hammock. Uh, we gave my son a hammock because, you know, Father's Day. Yeah, right. And uh, uh, every father deserves a hammock on Father's Day. So, <laughs> so we set up the hammock, and uh, he, he climbed in. And then the little girls just immediately climbed in on top of him. So, uh, you know, that was big fun. And so they got to talk about being on sailing ships and uh, having adventures. And uh, Seraphim, I think, totally would uh, instantly, you know, take to the pirate life. Yeah. She would, she would be. <laughs> Charlotte, is, Charlotte is like this quiet sort of contemplative little girl. Ah. And uh, Seraphim is just this fearless adventurer. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's fantastic, and it's a real blessing that you're uh, that you live near them all because uh, yeah. that yeah. it's that's tough when they're far away like that. Well, listen, I want to just jump right into this, and I've been looking at uh, some of your uh, well, as we always do, or as I always do, look at your. Uh, 
Catholic and Enjoying It. That's the name of your Pathos blog. <laughs> and uh, I noticed that uh, you know, one thing that you recently uh, posted about was, uh, well, now I'm going to have to get it. Let, let's talk about Romans 13. Right. And uh, that, of course, was invoked by uh, Attorney General. Jeff Sessions in connection with uh, what's going down around the border, and uh, apparently Sarah Huckabee Sanders also chimed in with that. I knew she said uh, what they were doing was biblical, but biblical. I don't, I, I didn't know, uh, biblical, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, like you know. Uh, <laughs> slavery in Egypt was biblical, right? <laughs> I was going to say, it, was, it, it um, is biblical in the sense that Pharaoh did this kind of stuff, but uh, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Yeah, so I mean, so I guess uh, let's just begin by let's talk about Romans thirteen. Romans thirteen. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's that's that. Of course, is the uh, letter of Saint Paul to the Romans, and at that particular point, he talks about being subject to the governing authorities. And uh, you're of the opinion that uh, they they're misinterpreting this a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what kind? Of- more than a little bit. So Romans yeah. thirteen, j- just to give the, I, the the piece that I wrote, uh, which you know listeners out there can find if they go to Pathos and just Google. Let's talk about Romans thirteen and my name, Mark Shea S H E A. Romans thirteen is one of the rare moments where Paul talks about the relationship of the Christian to the state. Uh, there's what you've got in the New Testament, of course, is you're not getting from Paul uh, some giant treatise on civics uh, from Paul. Uh, Paul is an apostle of a minuscule sect uh, that consists of some Jews and some Christians uh, who are living... Gentiles, you mean? Uh, or I'm sorry, some Gentiles. Yeah, uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Sorry, that was brain fart. Um, but there you did it. You're not supposed to uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to say that in the air. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, but uh, what what has this to be? This is Mark Shane, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Raw and uh, live. <laughs> That's right. Go ahead. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, but, uh, but Paul is an apostle of a very small sect at this point that is spreading out across the Roman Empire. Uh, and the thing, the first thing to understand about Paul uh, is he's writing to encourage this mixed community of Jewish and Gentile Christians uh, at Rome, and he's primarily writing them uh, about their own issues. And their own issues are, how do we live as an ethnically mixed community of Jews and Gentiles? Uh, uh, and, you know, what what is the relationship of both Jew and Gentile to the gospel, and, and so on and so forth. That's the main reason that Paul's writing, which is why we're talking about Romans chapter 13, not Romans chapter 1. Uh Romans chapter 13 is what Paul is getting to after he's addressed all the main things that he's interested in, which is stop fighting about, you know, who's the better Christian. Uh, the, the main problem that the, that the Romans are struggling with is uh, a, a mixed community in which uh, Jews and Gentiles are fighting over the question. They're, they're like cancer patients who are fighting over the question of who's the least terminal. Uh, (laughs) And uh, Paul is saying, you're both terminal. That's the problem. The problem is sin. Jews are no better than Gentiles, and so we require the gospel. And when Jesus comes, what he has done is uh, uh, he has become the Savior of both Jew and Gentile, so Jews are not better than Gentiles, Gentiles are not better than Jews, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but thanks be to God, Christ uh, has come to bring salvation for all. That's what most of Romans is about. Romans only has 15 chapters in it, 
So when we get to the discussion of the state, what Paul is now doing is he's saying, okay, now that we've worked out these ish, these you know these internecine squabble issues between Jews and Gentiles within the Christian community, then he turns to the question of, <clears throat> okay, now that we're all on the same page, how do we conduct ourselves in a pagan world uh, where the overwhelming <laughs> majority of the population all around us is not Christian? Now what do we do? And so then he turns to the question of how do we uh, uh, regard the state? The state is a pagan state run by a pagan emperor. Uh, it's not a democracy. Uh, Paul isn't really even talking about the responsibilities of the citizen to the state. Here he's talking about the, the relationship of the subject to the state. Why? Because almost nobody in his community is a citizen. Uh, well, he was, well, he was a citizen, but for whatever he good that's right. He right, was right. a citizen, but he was a, he was a remarkable exception. Right. Uh, and his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was not a citizen. And that's why Jesus meets the fate that he does. That's why Jesus was crucified instead of getting a nice, decent beheading like a citizen does. Right. Uh, and so what Paul clearly understands is that the state is capable of grave sin because it was the state that killed <laughs> his great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus was crucified by a representative of the Roman state. And in point of fact, uh, Paul uh, met with some harassment with government authorities, did he not? Absolutely, he sure does. Yeah, Paul gets beaten up and put in jail by the state. Uh, and by the way, he's he's a smart cookie when it comes to his relationship uh, to the state. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But what Paul gets, of course, is that uh, a, even a pagan state is better than no state at all. Uh He's not an anarchist. You mean he he's wasn't an anarchist? Okay. Not an anarchist. He's not a libertarian. Uh, and so what he does is he tells the – this is – I'm quoting Paul here now. He tells the Romans, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of him who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes for the authorities. That's, that's how you can tell he's not a libertarian. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay all of them their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. So, much, you know, so, so what you're saying is, is that Paul would not agree with the statement that taxation is theft? Right, absolutely. Nor would Jesus, who says very, in much simpler terms, because he's Jesus, he says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. So what's Paul doing here? Well, what Jeff Sessions and Sarah Sanders, and by the way, every tyrant who has ever ruled a Christian population uh, is trying to say here is Paul is saying that uh, whatever the state says is the is the word of God and you have to do it. Uh, that is absolutely not what Paul is saying here. What Paul is saying here is more or less what Thomas Jefferson Splittingerson uh, says uh, in his preamble uh, to the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson, who's just about, of course, to say, we are, we are splitting with the state uh, of Great Britain. Uh, Jefferson makes the point that prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils 
uh, are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. So don't be like post-war Italy, you know, <laughs> and have the government collapse every three months because that's bad. Uh, you, you, you know, transportation doesn't work. You can't get health care. Uh, you know, food bread lines are, you know, going crazy. The state, uh, even a bad state and all states are bad in weather. Even a bad state is preferable to no state is Paul's bottom line. And that's what he's talking about when he's saying that authority, you know, there's no authority, but uh, what, what God gives. Uh, and Jesus, by the way, will say the, exactly the same thing to Pontius Pilate hours before Pontius Pilate sentences him to be crucified. You would have no power over me, says Jesus, uh, if it were not given to you from above. Uh, and so it's really important to understand what is and is not being said by Paul here. Paul is not not saying whatever the state says is the word of God. He is not saying that uh, the state is incapable of sin. <laughs> and, you know, he's not, he's not a totalitarian. Uh, and in fact, the, the Nero that he's talking about, the, the Caesar that he's talking about is Nero, who is going to kill him uh, a few years after he writes Romans 13. Uh, so it's really important to get that that uh, the New Testament is not pronouncing some kind of uh, blanket blessing on, you know, whatever the state says or does is uh, the perfect will of God. Uh, sometimes the state can uh, murder the Son of God. Uh, and, the, and, of course, the Roman state is going to go on uh, a few years after this. It's not only going to kill Paul, it's going to kill Peter, our first pope. Uh, and Nero is going to use the very flock that Paul is writing to to light his gardens with their burning bodies. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> well, and you know, it, it, to, to take Romans 13 out of context like this, I mean, first of all, even if you were sola scriptura, if you were, it took that position from the Protestant point of view, which I suppose Jeff Sesson does, uh, uh, you, God, the, the, the United the, Methodists are are like they're they're calling him up on canonical charges as a heretic. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I've heard of that. But what what, what I'm saying is is that even even that's not excusable because of the context to which the entire New Testament in which that statement is found. But for us Catholics, uh, we know from Saint Thomas Aquinas, we know from the Catechism, we know that an unjust law is no law at all. Absolutely right. That, yeah. That, that, and so and so there's no so when you look at the situation that's taking place down at the border right now, uh, up to and including separating a a child with Down syndrome, right from from, from her parents. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, uh, in one of my articles, I referred to this as a stench in the nostrils of the Lord, and I can't think of a better way to describe it. Right. I mean, right. And and so and and so. Uh, there was a Catholic bishop who uh, suggested that there might be canonical penalties for Catholics who participate in this this event, and nope. uh, and and and, and, there's a, and and it's obeying the law to do it. But clearly, there's no excuse for somebody who would say that they are basing what they are about from the Catholic tradition to say right. to try and justify this on the basis of well, yeah. this is the law. No, you know, that, there's just no way to, that, well, that, that that's no argument at all. And, and the dy dynamics that we're seeing, in fact, the the people who are appealing to, uh, you know, we were just following orders, uh, are uh, they are doing it in the teeth of what every American bishop who has addressed this. And by the way, that means every American bishop, the USCCB has issued a statement, you know, condemning this. That means all the bishops are condemning this. Yeah, well, you know, they're in the hands uh, of George Soros. That's, uh, absolutely, sure, of course, yeah. George, George yeah. Soros. <laughs> yes. the, the, yes. the puppet master who just happens to be Jewish for no particular reason or anything, and we're not saying anything by that. <laughs> that's, I mean, this is, you know, this is classic 
you know, uh, uh, anti-Semitic dog whistling here that goes with this. You know, poor, <laughs> poor. I saw one, you know, EWTN commenter uh, who said she's standing with the bishops, and uh, you know this is wrong. Uh, and she was immediately condemned as a lackey of George Soros. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> well, <laughs> but people yeah. will believe anything to rationalize this. Well, you, know? you you've got to wonder why this becomes uh, something that's so easy for so many people to imbibe. Uh, I mean, I well, I, I been for fifteen years. I mean, they've been fed that boogeyman for fifteen years, George well, Soros. Yeah. Well, yeah, George Soros, but, you know, it's interesting that, and, and maybe there's a way in which uh, it could be said that I uh, I don't fully comprehend my surroundings, but uh, it's been a while that I've been aware that there was uh, that there was an attempted infiltration into the church from this kind of group, uh, but, but, but I, had no, I had no idea. Uh, I thought it was just simply a matter of, uh, we, no, you just... Tell people, no, this is what Catholic teaching is on, on these particular social issues, and let people say, oh, okay, I get it now, and then we move on. But no, instead, uh, Pope Francis, and by the way, the only difference between Pope Francis and the popes that preceded him is that he just, whereas the popes that preceded him said what they had to say uh, in, in, in the form of encyclicals and so forth, he just goes out and says what he's got on his mind right in front of reporters. Right, and they yeah. and they they take it down with more or less accuracy. But now uh, he has come along at I think just the right time. Is it? It's almost as if uh, God was behind it or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to explain, you know. Yeah, right. And and and, and he's and uh, there is and and so there's either going to be. Uh, a devotion to the magisterium with respect to these issues, or they're going to have to turn around and say something that he turned him into some kind of an anti pope. Yeah. And uh, lo and behold, I, it's it's amazing that that's the tactic that they've tried. And it's oh, yeah. doubly amazing, and it's doubly amazing to me that they've been so successful at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, incredible. You know, I, I look at the uh, election of Francis. Uh, and Donald Trump as a church, but as a particularly obvious Kairos moment in the history of the church, uh, <laughs> in the history of the American church, but also in some ways the in the history of the global church, because we're such a powerful country, right? Uh, that uh, you know Trump and and part of what's been striking to me has been uh, as soon as I talk to people who Catholics who live outside the United States the response of Catholics outside of the United States with very rare exceptions has been what happened to you guys they're all like how can Catholics not see that this guy is is an obvious visible from space con man how can you not see that and at the same time they're going how can you possibly look at the things that are being done by this administration and then listen to the Holy Father and say, yeah, I'll have what Trump's having? <laughs> what yeah. is wrong with you? Have you lost your minds? I mean, outside the, the American church, this is the normal response that I get from Catholics everywhere in the world. They look at it and they cannot believe that uh, – uh, inside the American church, that it's the people who, you know, as Russell Moore, he's a, he's a Southern Baptist, but he, he gave a speech uh, a year or two ago, and he remarked uh, in a phrase that I'll never forget. He said, the religious right, he's talking about the American religious right, of course. He says, the religious right are the people the religious right warned you about 20 years ago. They have taken up every tactic uh, of the people that they hate, uh, oh, and they they have turned accusation into a form of confession. It's astonishing to watch how the things that we were told are culture war, and they all want to do this, and we're the we're the bulwark that stands between, 
you know, the leftists who want to put us all in concentration camps. That's what Obama's going to do. He's going to set up concentration camps. <laughs> and and, and, the, and these guys get power, and now they're setting up concentration camps, and they're doing it for children. And, yeah. and you know, we heard uh, 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 death panels. These people hate the disabled, and they're going to start, uh, uh, you know, persecuting the disabled today on Fox uh, uh, Corey Lewandowski one of Trump's henchmen uh, was was on a three man panel discussion it's always there's like two Fox you know t- t- Trump toadies and then there's at most the third guy maybe might be uh, a normal person and so uh, somebody started uh, po- trying to bring up this story of the ten- there's a ten year old girl with Down syndrome at the board. I have friends uh, with whose kids have Down syndrome, uh, and so somebody tried to point out this story of this ten year old kid who was you know t- Down syndrome girl torn away from her parents uh, by the appropriately named ICE uh, uh, and terrified and traumatized and everything he he, he tried to uh discuss this and Corey lewandowski a grown man on the air looked into the camera while the guy was trying to talk and went no leave it to beaver Uh, unbelievable mocking a traumatized 10 year old girl with down syndrome and no. uh, you know this happens over and over again. Yeah, well, this, that's the way uh, Jesus would behave, right? I absolutely sure. I mean, you know, and, and I look at that and I think, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I never voted for a Democrat since 1976. That was the last time I voted for a Democrat, and nobody's, I nobody's perfect. I totally believed. 20 years ago, I, if you had, you know, I, I totally believed, uh, in fact, I, I wrote an article one time back in the nineties called, uh, you know, I'm a one issue voter. Uh-huh. And, uh, for me, it was, this is about the dignity of human life. Uh, and so, uh, I'm going to vote for the party that, uh, is opposed to abortion. And, uh, that was why I voted Republican for years and years was because abortion was, this is. This is the issue. Uh, and it was only in the last 15 years ago or, or so that I, it finally began to dawn on me. And now is like, I'm ashamed that I didn't see it before because now it's just out in the open. Um, that the whole strategy uh, of the GOP, as far as the pro-life movement goes, uh, uh, is we will pretend to care about abortion every four years uh, and you will vote for us uh, and then what we'll do is we will use you to support every filthy anti-human thing that we want to do uh, and and it began to be clear to me that something was terribly wrong about 15 years ago when I began uh, uh, to see I uh, watching "Quote unquote uh, pro-life uh, conservative Christians, evangelical and Catholic, uh, both all saying, you know, let's have that war in Iraq that two bishops or two popes and all the bishops of the world condemned as not meeting just war criteria, and then most especially began to see Christians, white conservative." "Quote unquote pro-life Christians, not merely giving passive assent to the use of torture, uh, but passionately, uh, orgasmically loving the use of torture, finding every excuse they could possibly find to defend the use of torture." And I, th- at first, I thought there must be a communication mistake here because surely you can see that the the consequentialist ethic that lies behind the use of torture is exactly the same 
as the consequentialist ethic, ethic that lies behind the use of abortion. Let us do evil that good may come of it. Yeah, well, we There's don't this... have a Catholic party in the United States. You know. The... Wow! <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> you know, the punchline, the punchline to that whole abortion thing is that when, uh, and, and listen, abortion is a, you talk about a stench in the nostrils of God. That's terrible. Absolutely, but, it is. Of course, it is. But 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 when it but the point is, is when we when it's discussed politically, the idea is okay. We're going to appoint justices who will overturn Roe versus Wade, <laughs> which, which 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 in point of fact, which in point of fact has already been modified a little bit. But um, the the thing is, is that let's say Roe versus Wade is overturned. Well, what happens is it's not, it's not all of a sudden, you know, the, the Supreme Court didn't legalize abortion because it, because it was already, you know, it was possible for it to be legal before. I mean, it was legalized and, in my state three years before. Yeah, yeah right. So, and it, and when and if Roe versus Wade is overturned, it won't make it illegal. In point of fact, in point of fact, I suspect that the abortion industry in California will boom. As people from states say, maybe North Dakota that overturns it, you know, they'll just drive down to California or Oregon or maybe even Washington State and right. get the and, and uh, get their abortions. Yeah. And it, so it's not going to make it illegal all across the country. In order to make it illegal all across the country, you need a constitutional amendment, which right. requires which is uh, never going to happen. Uh, yeah, well, it's it's pretty. It's going to be difficult to get that it's because be, right, three three fourths of the states. But you know, you, you've. Uh, I mean, it's a. It, but it, it, when you when you take it, when when you go about it the way that uh, it has been gone about from using the GOP strategy, uh, you've uh, you you end up alienating a lot of people because of the fact that you are, you know, when, when you support the invasion of Iraq, when you support uh, quarantining and penning in children at the border uh when you support torturing uh you you uh your whole pro-life message becomes tainted it's it sounds like you're not uh trying to really save the lives of anybody that you but that your interest really is in interfering in women's bodies because right. if you, because if you don't care about if you don't care about the lives of people who are born, how can you care about the lives of people who are unborn? Exactly, and and you know the 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 huge blunder that the pro life movement made. I was not Catholic at the time, so I all this went past me. I was not aware of it at the time it was going on. But uh, you know the the church has always taught a consistent life ethic. That is the teaching of the church. The word heresy comes from a Greek word that refers to drawing a thread out of a whole weave of something. So, you know, you got that loose thread on your, on your sleeve, and you pull the thread off, and your sleeve falls off. That's what heresy is referring to, is that idea that you've taken some single thing and focused on it and used it as a weapon to destroy the whole weave. And so the power of all heretical thinking lies in the fact that what you're the thing that you focus on is something good so the archetypal heresy for example in the history of the church was the arian heresy and the what gave the arian heresy such immense power and made it so dangerous and destructive that it was it almost tore apart the church and almost tore apart the empire in the time of Constantine, was that Arius looked at the greatest possible thing there is in all of time, space, and eternity, God the Father, and used God the Father as a weapon to attack the rest of the church's teaching. What Arius said was, God the Father is God, and the Son is not God. The Holy Spirit is not God. Uh, and this, it was, a, it, was a, it was a blow right at the heart of the faith. And the reason it was so powerful and so hard to get Ar Arians uh, to realize they were wrong was because if you said they were wrong, they would say, so you, you're blaspheming God the Father then. And you thought, you know, and so the, the ch church really had to struggle with this. 
Uh, why do I bring that up? Because, of course, the dignity of an unborn baby is an enormously good thing. But what has happened in the last 35 years is that the pro-life movement has taken the unborn baby and said, this is the only thing that matters. Uh, and so you'll see over and over again the defense that's put up by uh, uh, white, conservative, quote-unquote, pro-life Christians, defense and passionate defense of this this systematic torture, and that's the word for it, of children at the border is, well, the unborn. You know, I bet the people who are defending these kids, these criminal kids coming in at the border, they don't care about abortion. And so what, what, what's effectively being done? The unborn is being used as a human shield to defend taking little kids... 10-year-old girls with Down syndrome, uh, mothers, babies nursing at their mother's breasts and tearing them away from their parents. Did you ever get lost at a grocery store when you were a little kid? Yeah, it took me five years to find my way home. Well, <laughs> have you ever had a moment where, when you were a little kid where you lost your parents, where you were afraid and you were in a strange place and, and your parents were gone? Yeah, well, sure. I, Everybody's I, I, I had that, that experience. Yeah. Yeah. This is being done to little kids, about 2,000 of them so far. They are being removed from their parents out of absolutely gratuitous and unnecessary spite. And the reason for this spite is very clear. Uh, in March, what Trump tried to do to get funding, you know, Trump promised he was going to make Mexico pay for his wall. Of course, Mexico's never going to pay for this stupid wall, right? right? But Trump is totally committed to this idiotic they might, wall. They, they might pay for more tunnels under the wall. But anyway, <laughs> right. So what Trump did, of course, was that he realized, I've made this, I've lied and made this promise that I can't possibly keep, So, but I have to have funding for my wall. What will I do? Well, the first thing that he did was he looked at DACA kids, kids who who have lived here all their lives. They were brought here as little tiny kids. They are Americans. They have been raised as Americans. They, many of them don't even speak the language of the country that they came from. Uh, and what he did was he said, I'm going to hold DACA kids hostage so I can get funding for my wall. And if, the, if I don't get my funding, then I'm going to start sending these kids back. Uh, and so uh, the court struck that down. So he had no hostages. He needed hostages. So Steve Miller, probably the single most despicable man in that administration, said, the reincarnation of Goebbels. Or <laughs> yeah, said, here's a whole bunch of kids we can use as hostages. And so they instituted two months or so ago, they instituted the zero tolerance policy so that even people who are seeking asylum, uh, who've committed no crime, and it, and and by the way, crossing the border is a misdemeanor. You want to have your kid taken away from jaywalking because that's what we're talking about here. Um, uh, uh, Trump said, "Great, we will hold them hostage," and that's what this policy is about. And so this is a man. And by the way, this is a man who uh, uh, about twenty years ago, in a spat with his family over daddy's money vindictively cut off medical care for his own infant nephew with cerebral palsy out of just vindictive spite. That is the man who is president of the United States. And do you think that that man has any qualms at all about using 2,000 or 10,000 uh, uh, traumatized children uh, to get what he wants? Absolutely not. And that's what this policy is about. And the most passionate defenders of this policy are white, quote-unquote, pro-life, conservative Christians. They identify themselves that way. Uh, and they are at war with the Pope. Steve Bannon was on the air attacking the Pope yesterday. 
Uh, they're at war with the bishops of the church. They're at war with God. And they're at war with the least of these. And there is no justification for this. Absolutely none. No, I, there's nothing that I can find in Catholic doctrine or in the Bible or uh, anything. I mean, I can, you know, maybe if I, I never finished Mein Kampf, there might be something in it there. But I. <laughs> <laughs> It's, well, but, if but, Ellie would love it. You know? Yeah, well, I, I don't even know if he would go that far. <laughs> what, what, what is, uh, it, it, it is something to behold, but let me run something by you and see what you think of this. I, I've long been of the opinion that uh, the opinions of many of us here in the United States, perhaps of most of us, alas, is, is a media-driven thing. It, it, the, there are two parties and so the media drives the idea that there are uh, two sets of opinions. And so as a result, uh, if you, it, depending on what side you are on, you have to agree with all of these things. In other words, you buy your opinion in packages. Hence, if you're a Republican because you started out that way, uh, because you're pro-life and you're opposed to uh, killing children in the womb, a practice that we euphemistically refer to as abortion, as abortion. Right. Uh, and then you, uh, and, and then you start out that way. Well, then, okay, slowly, you know, I'm on your side, I'm on this side and then mm -hmm. there's other folks and then, okay, I'm on this side. And so basically, uh, inadvertently, uh, uh, they end up just pr pretty much buying a whole package of, of ideas. And so if you start right. out with the idea that, you know, okay, I'm doing uh, this Republican thing because I'm a, 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 I'm a committed Christian, uh, it's, right. it's easy from that point to manipulate the brain into thinking, all right, uh, since I'm a, commit I'm a Republican because I'm a committed Christian, well, therefore it follows that I have to follow the GOP line. And, uh, and, 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 and couple with that, the Fact that the the infiltration of the GOP into the in, into evangelical Christianity uh, was a was quite a deliberate thing by Jerry Falwell and other one other guy, and uh, they, and that picked abortion af after they realized that their real issue, uh, the issue of Bob Jones University losing its tax exempt status because of its racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, realized that that wasn't going to be uh, much of a winner, so they decided, let's go with abortion. Up to that time, evangelical Christian Christianity didn't have abortion uh, at the forefront of their ethical issues like the Catholic Church always had, but, but they just picked that, and, uh, well, and the whole thing went from there. It, 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 it's, it, there's a bit of complexity here. Uh, what happened was uh, that uh, Francis Schaeffer, an evangelical theologian, his son is Frankie Schaeffer. You might have heard of him. Yeah, I know. Uh, an Orthodox I, I was, I, I'm old enough to remember the dad. Ah, okay. So Fran Francis Schaeffer was the one who uh, I think is a genuine issue of conscience for him. Uh, uh, realized that uh, uh, abortion, that the Catholics were right about abortion. You're, uh, you're right. Francis the dad. Uh, yeah, Francis, Francis the father. He, he was yeah. uh, he was a reformed uh, Protestant, um, but um, recognized that there was a real problem um, um, with abortion. Well, the thing is, is at the same time, uh, the GOP, uh, which was ramping up for the 1980 uh, elections, uh, also realized that this was a wedge issue, and it. And you know, Democrats were who had you could find, for example, uh, you know, rhetoric from uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, Jesse Jackson, um, uh, so forth, who were opposed to abortion at one time. Uh, but they, you know, they gave up on this. And so there was a real, you know, there was a real crisis of conscience, I think, for a lot of. Uh, you know, old sort of blue collar uh, Catholic Democrats and so forth, as the Democratic Party began to say, uh, uh, you know, we're we're going to support uh, uh, the right to choose on abortion and so forth. 
Uh, and so both political parties figured out that uh, they could make political capital out of this. The, the weird thing about American demographics on abortion uh, is that you've got about 20% of Americans who are, we support abortion on demand without apology. And then you get another 20% who are, we need to outlaw abortion. And then you get the middle 60% who really don't like abortion. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. If they never had to hear about it ever again, it would be too soon. Uh, but at the same time, they don't want to be that guy uh, or that woman who has to tell the 15-year-old in a crisis pregnancy whose boyfriend is you know, going to dump her uh, if she doesn't kill that child. We lost you there for, we lost you there for a minute, Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah. We lost you oh, okay. for a second. We, we, we lost you at 15, the 15 year old. Oh, okay. So who doesn't want to be, you know, so you get the 60% of people who don't like abortion and have absolutely no intention of outlawing it because they're not going to be that person. That's going to tell somebody in a desperate crisis pregnancy, uh, that no, you're, it, you're on your own. Uh, and so it is always possible for anybody to say and be right that 80% of the American people don't like abortion. And they can also say 80% of the American people have no intention of ever outlawing abortion. And they're both right. Uh, and American politics absolutely turns on that dynamic. Uh, and the the cynical and disgusting part of what the party of Trump has done uh, is that they understand now because uh, the pro-life movement is, has trained itself uh, to think this way. Uh, they understand that all you have to do is make some pleasing noises about abortion and you can do anything, you know, um, that a man, <laughs> anybody could seriously say of a man like Donald Trump, this is the most pro-life president we have ever had. Yeah, no, I <laughs> and I, mean I, that. You know? I see that all the time. Uh, no, it's a, that is spectacular brainwashing. Uh, you know, and the reality is that this most pro-life president we've ever had. What has he done? Well, he he made some nice noises at the March for Life. And he gave us the standard Republican consolation participation trophy of overturning the Mexico City policy. And he's made some noises about Planned Parenthood, but refunded Planned Parenthood six times since its inauguration. So, so the reality is you got two parties who both... Uh, uh, support the status quo on abortion. Uh, both parties have no intention of ever overturning Roe v. Wade. That is not going to happen. Well, the, what, the would, what, would, what would the Republicans do if they overturned uh, Roe exactly versus Wade? Exactly right. R run on their economic policy? I mean, it, would be, it would be insane for them to overturn Roe v. Wade because that's the carrot that, <laughs> that keeps uh, you know, gazillions of social security. Giving, yeah, yeah they, they, the right. people keep chasing that carrot. You know, someday uh, in the great by and by, the Republican Party is going to uh, support a, a point of court that's going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And when magic uh, abortion is all magicked away, then everything else that we have said yes to will have been worth it. Right. Let us do evil that good may come of it. And so, uh, you know, you've got now, you know, I, I I've coined, uh, I've been using a term, I didn't coin it, I, I borrowed it from, I stole it from Andrew Sullivan, who initially I thought was wrong, but I, I think that the term really is a useful one. I draw a distinction between a Christian who is a disciple of Jesus Christ, uh, and who does what his holy church teaches us to do, uh, and a Christianist who is a member of a theopolitical cult that is dedicated to enacting the agenda of the party of Trump and which uses Christian imagery and jargon 
to defend the utterly, utterly indefensible. Mark, 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 I, I, just a minute. I, you just sent me back here. Uh, you mean you did not make up that word Christianist? I did not. I stole it. Oh, Mark, so, well, we, 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 we've just got to quit here. I mean, this, okay. This, this is, See, I, <laughs> I have shattered than, your this whole. This is more than I could stand. I mean, really. I know, I know. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I borrowed it. See, the great thing about being a Catholic is it more like <laughs> the great thing about being a Catholic is that you can plagiarize and call it being faithful to the tradition. So uh, you know that's <laughs> that's Andrew what Sullivan. I'm doing here. So, so Andrew, uh, Andrew Sullivan's Andrew Sullivan's saying, uh, not exactly. He's not exactly the, uh, the magisterial, the, uh, magisterial <laughs> tradition, but it's a useful word nonetheless uh, and because it, it, it really does draw the distinction. You know, I as Catholics we cannot. We can't be Anabaptists. We can't be Protestants. We can pick our friends, but we are stuck with our family. Uh, and so, you know, if you are validly baptized and have not renounced the faith, sorry, but as a as a Catholic, I can't say, "Oh, you're not a real Christian." Uh, you know that Protestants could do that. I had a friend one time who took a class. <laughs> she took a class on the Holocaust from a local rabbi. And in the class, there was like a whole bunch of evangelical Protestants who were in this class. And their This is, is going to hurt, isn't it? This is going to hurt. This, this story is going to hurt, isn't it? It's going to okay. hurt. I just, want, I just want to warn the listeners. All right, go ahead. What the rabbi did was he, he, he uh, sat down and uh, he read out loud... A um, uh, a document uh, from a late medieval uh, Christian thinker that was just this, you know, humiliating, embarrassing, grotesque diatribe, you know, against the Jews and their lies and all the rest of it. It was just this vicious anti-Semitic tract. And uh, so he put it to the class. You know, what do you make of this? Right? It, well. You know, evangelicals have a ready response for anything that a Christian says that that embarrasses them. Oh, that he wasn't a real Christian. I see. So, so that was their response. He said, "No okay. true Scotsman fallacy." Right, the no true Scotsman fallacy. And so he looked yes. at he said, "Martin Luther wrote this." Are you going to tell me Martin Luther was not a real Christian? Well, they had nothing they could say. A Catholic has to say of someone who is validly baptized, and especially of someone who is a member of the Catholic Communion, Luther eventually was not a member of the Catholic Communion, but even Luther, you know what? That guy was a Christian. You can't say he's not a real Christian. You can say he was a bad one, uh, and that's perfectly legitimate for us to say. You know, so so Dante can put popes in his hell, uh, you know, right? And, and and say just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're incapable of doing despicable and saying despicable things. You know, it is to Christians that the New Testament is addressed with all the warnings about hell. The New Testament warnings about hell are not saying, "Hey, check out Nero over there; he's going to hell." <laughs> Well, that is a particularly pernicious uh, eventuality to it because of the fact if you think that a true Christian is somebody who does no wrong, yeah. then you're going to apply that to yourself at some point, and that's going to, and when you do do wrong, you're going to say, well, no, it's not wrong because of this or that. And right. so, so now going back to the topic du jour, uh, what's happening at the border right now? The uh, this is why we have a magisterium. <laughs> yeah, the whole idea is well, no, it must be right because I'm for it. And I'm a Christian. <laughs> right. Well, you know and, this, and this takes us back to uh, the central problem of the pro-life movement, uh, and and Russell Moore's comment that the religious right are now that the people that the religious right warned you about twenty years ago, the pro-life movement for a long time was in the position of of being a voice of conscience to people who were ignoring the teaching of the church on abortion. But it fell, as Pharisees fell, into the 
fatal idea that, well, I am the conscience of the church. I, I am, I am the real Catholic. I'm the real Christian. Uh, and you know, and now we've got a pope uh, who is not a real Christian. He's not a real Catholic. We we can ignore him. What we need to do is listen to our trusted culture war voices. It is more important to listen to Laura Ingram or Raymond Arroyo or whoever is telling us that you can ignore the Pope, you can ignore the bishops because they're a bunch of liberals uh, and and who have now gotten themselves into the headspace where they, they have convinced themselves that if you are defending children being tortured at the border, then you must be a liberal, and therefore you can be ignored uh, because liberals are all uh, in favor of abortion. Uh, you know, it is, it is pagan logic. It is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And you've stopped listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit in the church uh, if you're defending this kind of evil taking place at the border. The pro-life okay. ethic is simple. Defend life from conception to natural death. Just do that. That is, uh, you know, you can't go wrong with that. We've got about five minutes here, Mark. You know, and I, uh, I want to raise one thing with you, and it's uh, something that's been on my mind for a while. When you talk about the critics of Pope Francis, um, and if you ever inquire, this is just my experience, and maybe you've had a different one, uh, When it, whenever I inquire, what exactly are you objecting to? What heresy is he proclaiming? And Crickets. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, there's Amorous Letitia, of course, and that, that that of course was just dealing with canon law, yeah. uh, and uh, the. Uh, but it's, uh, the, 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 I mean, in terms of what he's what being proposed or suggested or not even being proclaimed there, just to, right. you know, but I ne- I never actually get a, a straight answer. Paul uh, uh, Francis is. I think extremely easy to understand. The people who tell me he's confusing me, uh, I, I just I don't believe it anymore. Um, Francis is not confusing. Francis is plain as day. Francis, uh, if you want to understand him, all you have to understand is he has preached good news to the poor. That's it. His whole pontificate summed up in those words. This guy is all about evangelization, and he is in particular is all about evangelization to the least of these, and therefore he offends reactionaries, and he offends members of the party of Trump. He offends reactionaries because they hate evangelization. They don't want people coming into the church. They want to kick people out of the church uh, and arrive at this purer, smaller church. And... Uh, and he offends uh, the party of Trump because the party of Trump is the enemy of the least of these. It is the enemy of the poor. And you can see this in our border policy. And yeah, well, that's why he offends people. Yeah, well, I I, I just t- I keep thinking I'm not smart enough to be confused because everything he says is uh, consistent, sometimes uh, an outright repeat. Sure, uh, it's simple. Of, it's of, easy of, every, of everything the church has said up till now. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, back back in that uh, back when those uh, uh, industrial buildings fell over, uh, which country was that? Was that Biafra? And uh, you know, he was saying that these people were being paid slave wages. Well, that didn't shock me. Really. I mean, that's what the church would say the same thing. And all of a sudden, sure. you know, that really started things. Uh, what? We have to pay living wages. That's just outrageous. And, you know, and, you, and, you, and, and it's amazing how you see this on Catholic sites when people jump in and say, well, living wages, what's a living? You know, and they try and play these uh, Socratic games with you, right? It, it's right. just, uh, uh, it's uh, it's an amazing thing to see. But it's a good thing, Mark, that you're out there uh, writing and uh, uh, setting the record straight on a lot of these things because uh, right. we need a voice like that to let us know we're here in the final minutes and we're getting to the final minute i need to learn how to do the clock thing better but um you know it's uh, let's let's remind everybody you uh blog all the time at patheos and the name of your blog is what sir 
Uh, the name of the blog is uh, Catholic and Enjoying It. You can find my, just Google Pathos in my name, you'll find me. You can also find uh, my website and all my books if you want to buy any of my books and stuff uh, at mark com. All right. Well, that's very, that's good. And, uh, and, and your new book, when do you expect that to be done? Oh, I don't know. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm kind of doing a tag team. I'm working on, on my Creed book and I'm also working on a novel. Oh, so, okay. Well, which so, is a different set right. of muscles so, altogether. So, 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 so everybody just, uh, keep your ears to the railroad tracks and we'll, uh, that time will come up. Well, everybody, this has been the inaugural, the first, uh, edition of Christian Democracy. We were very fortunate to have Mark Shea here. And uh, I hope that you'll be listening in uh, next uh, Tuesday. Good night. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.